every one of you are proof that we will not be silent. Welcome back. It's been almost two months since two black Tennessee lawmakers were kicked out of their seats, expelled for leading anti-gun violence protests. They've been temporarily reappointed to their seats, but they're now facing a special election to win them back for good. I sat down with one of the two, Representative Justin Pearson, for a wide-ranging interview about the issue he's risked his political career on and questions from white and black people about his authenticity. As declared. As declared. By the Constitution. By the Constitution. Of this state. Of this state. Of Tennessee. Of Tennessee. So help me God. So help me God. Yeah. You have been reappointed to the seat you were expelled from, but that's temporary. Mm -hmm. You do have to go through an election. Are you concerned about challengers in that election and potentially losing the seat? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyone who runs for office, you have to be prepared to lose. Justin Pearson is in an unexpected political battle. This body hereby expels Justin J. Pearson from his seat as a member of the House of Representatives of the 113th General Assembly of the state of Tennessee. The 28-year-old had been in office for just a few months when he and fellow Representative Justin Jones were expelled on April 6 by the Republican-controlled House, largely white and male, for breaking House procedural rules. We need action. We need action. Power to the people. The people who march. The people who speak up. The people who advocate. You can't come to the well, bring your friends, and throw a temper tantrum with an adolescent bullhorn. Pearson, Jones, and Representative Gloria Johnson had been leading calls for gun reform on the House floor days after a gunman killed six people, including three children, in a mass shooting on March 27th at the Covenant School, a Christian school in Nashville. Only Pearson and Jones, both black and in their 20s, were expelled. The expulsion made national news. Tennessee has only expelled lawmakers a handful of times. Instantly making Pearson one of the most recognizable politicians in the country. Right now, what we are seeing is the erosion of our democracy. What's the dynamic like working with the people who voted to expel you? I mean, they haven't changed, right? You still have people who are governed and guided by white supremacy and patriarchy and control and power and abusing power over other people. I think what is different is the movement of people that has risen up, Gen Z, young millennials, who are refusing to accept this status quo as the way that things have to be. And something President Biden did share with me as a piece of advice that he was given was you have to know what you're willing to lose for. And the reality is, uh, if we're going to lose because we're advocating for justice, because we're advocating for every person to be able to be free in their community without the fear of gun violence, if we're going to lose for those issues, then I am willing to do that. We did nothing but came to this floor to say we need to listen to the constituents who are asking for us to end gun violence. You're risking your political career on this issue. Why is gun violence so important to you? It's important to me because I have experienced the effects of gun violence. I buried a cousin at age 21 because he was shot and killed. Last fall, I buried Dr. Yvonne Nelson. She was one of the first supporters I ever had in the environmental justice movement from gun violence. And this January, I went to Larry Thorne's funeral uh, and our family helped to pay for it uh, because he was killed from gun violence. He and I graduated from high school together 10 years ago. Uh, and somehow at the same time that uh, we're being elected, we're planning for a funeral. This does not make sense and this is not right and we know in our hearts that something can be different. We know that good legislation can help to prevent gun violence from happening. And it doesn't make any sense that in this country, of so many smart people, of so much opportunity and possibility, so many folks are not being able to grow old because we are failing to act. Why do you think more politicians haven't stepped up and said, we have to do something? They're afraid of the gun lobbyists. Their constituents want just laws. Over 70% of people in Tennessee want red flag laws. Over 70% of Tennessee across different spectrums, different identities, gun owners and non-gun owners want to see legislation that ensures that their kids come home safe, that they go to a bank and that they don't get murdered. A majority of people want that. But the gun lobbyists seem to have a hold on the Republican Party of Tennessee in such a way that it is strangulating democracy. We know there are laws that could fix a problem. And the people who have the power of the pen, as it were, to, to fix the problem, say, all I can do is give thoughts and prayers. And these are the same people who said, you know what's a danger to children in Tennessee? Drag shows. That is harming children. 
and they wrote 20 plus laws targeting the LGBTQIA community this past session. But not guns, not AR-15s, not all these assault weapons and weapons of war, that's not harming children. There's no way that you actually believe a drag show is more dangerous to a child than a person going into a school with an AR-15 and killing them. And oftentimes, the people carrying their minds, this, this is a black people problem. Gun violence is an urban, inner city black people problem. This isn't some white folk need to worry about, especially not rich white folk. And then, a uh, mass shooting happens at a conservative Christian school that costs about $14,000 a year to go to. You can't keep the same perspective after you get proximate and you realize that gun violence is all of our problem. A lot of people do think of gun violence as an inner city problem, as a black people problem, as a poor people problem. Right. Uh, when it comes to Memphis specifically, you know, this city is majority black. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been estimated that 70% of violent crime here involves a gun. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that people generally don't seem to care as much about mm -hmm. violence that's taking place in black communities as they do when, say, a mass, a mass shooting mm -hmm. happens, mm -hmm. as opposed to many people being shot in the hood. <laughs> exactly, uh, and this is what part of the conversation that we have to expand, right? I'm deeply concerned about mass shootings, just as much of, as Covenant as uh, what the Waffle House several years ago. Uh, and I'm very concerned about everyday shootings because Southwest Memphis doesn't have a single gun manufacturer, and yet we have all of these guns in our neighborhoods and communities. We have some of the people who've been made the poorest because of the lack of wages, and yet have been able to access weapons. Where are they coming from? Who is bringing them into our neighborhoods and communities? And something tells me they don't look a whole lot like the people that I represent in District 86. And so the reason that I think there is a lack of care and concern about the everyday violence experienced in our communities is because white people in particular think that it is the fault of the individuals who are suffering from gun violence who are to blame. Are you hopeful, though, that anything will actually change? Yeah, I remain uh, eternally hopeful and eternally optimistic that the status quo that we are living in is not the one that we're going to die in. And you can't doubt the impact of proximity to the issue of gun violence. Dr. Catherine Kuntz, who led Covenant School, was a close family friend of the governor's. Somehow, when you get proximate to the people, who are suffering, when you're proximate to folks who are going through pain, when you're proximate to people who are being impoverished, when you're proximate to people who are experiencing gun violence, you cannot keep the same perspective that you had when it was just a straw man, a straw figure. It is possible and it is important that we find a way uh, to remove individuals who are a threat to themselves or to our society, to remove them from access to weapons. Days after the Justins were expelled, Tennessee's Republican Governor Bill Lee asked lawmakers to pass a red flag law to keep guns away from those who pose a risk to themselves or others, and announced he'd bring lawmakers back for a special session to focus on gun reform later this summer. How much credit do you take for what's happening? Yeah, I don't really take much credit at all. I give credit to those who have taken this tragedy of the killing of people in Nashville Covenant School. Uh, six people, three children who were just nine, year old, nine years old, they've taken this tragedy and said that we will not, not, not uh, wallow in the tragedy, but rather we will be triumphant in spite of it. Now, you started your political career in college. Mm -hmm. You looked a little different then. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Justin J. Pearson, and I'm running for president of BSG. You were sworn in in a dashiki. Yeah. Now you wear your hair out. It's natural. Tell me about your political evolution. Yeah, I am fully and 100% Justin J. Pearson. I always have been. Uh, but the reality is, as you grow up, you continue to learn more. You continue to experience more. You explore more of the world. And you build yourself into the person that you know God's calling for you to be. My savior, my black Jesus, he was lynched by the government on Friday. And they thought that all hope had been lost. So a lot of people don't trust politicians sure. to begin with, and then they see this evolution and they question its authenticity. Mm -hmm. You know, they wonder, is this something that you're doing just to be electable? Mm -hmm. how, how would you answer that, that yeah. criticism, that suspicion? I mean, yeah, that suspicion typically comes from these white racist people, particularly one from Tucker Carlson, who's no longer uh, employed, uh, last I checked. And so I, I, I don't uh, give him a lot of credence, nor uh, his audience or viewership. And in what ways do you think you're going to be different as a, as a Gen Z politician? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for the many people who marched for hundreds and thousands of miles uh, in order to create opportunities like this one. And I also think about, you know, in the Civil Rights Movement, how little credit black women were really given for the contributions that they made. Uh, and the reality is every movement is powered by black women. 
which is why my mother is so important and, and my fiance is so important and my team's leadership is all black women, uh, the senior leadership of our team. Uh, black women lead movements. Uh, and so I think prioritizing the voices of black women is something that we're going to do differently. You mentioned your fiance. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people have noticed a, a beautiful lady standing yeah. near you during always. interviews and press conferences. Yeah. You know, as a woman, that's the part that I'm always curious about is the woman yeah. behind the man. Tell, oh, can you tell me a little bit? She's not behind. She's beside, <laughs> in front of. She's amazing. Ocean A. R. Gilliam. That's my best friend in the whole world. Some say Pearson's fiance, Ocean A. Gilliam, is also his best political asset. She's his chief of staff and has been a major part of his new political career. The thing that I really appreciate about Justin is that he's all about the we, and it's not just about um, himself. He really cares about District 86 and his home of, of, of Memphis and Westwood. And that's his number one priority, is to figure out how is it that we actually help our most marginalized people. They met in 2016 at Princeton, but reconnected during the social justice protests of 2020. How significant has she been in your, your political career? She's been everything. I mean, she moved to Memphis uh, from LA once we launched. And from then till now, she really has made Memphis and Tennessee home. So going from Memphis to Nashville and all that um, to really like, motivate and inspire and, and move people in this movement forward. Now here we are. Here you are, yeah. planning a wedding. Yeah, well, enjoying being engaged. Uh, <laughs> the wedding is some date in the future. So we're gonna do some small in LA sooner and then some bigger in Memphis for, for everybody to come to. Now, you've done some traveling. You've gone to some other states. You're, you're received very warmly where you've, wherever you go right now. What, what does the future look like for you? Do you? Are you interested in national politics? I'm interested in serving District 86. Any point in the future, does it interest you, the idea of going to Washington? District 86, Tennessee State House, votejustinj.com. That's where you can help us out to do that.